feature films, uh, traditionally we have like a large 10 ton truck, uh, which then my cart will live on that 10 ton truck. It usually is two carts. It's usually one cart is like a data cart for my media manager um, or, or loader or whatever to load data onto. And then I have my DIT cart uh, and tent and stuff like that that usually live on the truck. Um, something that's very popular recently is actually having a, uh, a, a Sprinter van or a Nissan NV uh, cargo van that you can stand up in and you can load your cart in and, um, and work from that. Because that effectively is the tent. It's just a mobile tent at that point. Um, and, you know, air conditioning. I mean, there's, when on hot summer days, air conditioning's a paramount. I mean, you do, I did 10 weeks in Michigan, and if it, within 20 minutes of being on set, I was in a complete total sweat. My gear was, like, heating up through the roof. Um, so it's good to, like, you know, it's good to have a, a van in that respect. You can do it. But um, what I don't like about vans is I can't be next to the DP. Not having the proper drives. If uh, a client shows up with USB 3 drives and I don't have USB 3 capability on my cart, and right now I don't have USB 3 capability on the on the main cart. I have it on my MacBook Pro, but unless I'm using that as an ingest, USB 3 is wasted on me. Now, what I utilize on my cart is eSATA and SAS. So I have uh, two RAID 5s a 24 terabyte and a 12 terabyte um, connected via uh, serial attached SCSI and then I have uh, extra ports uh, for eSATA so that's usually that's where I plug in my production drives my transfer drives or shuttles um, if I don't have the proper connections the transfer is going to be bloody slow and that can can prolong your day and keep you on the clock longer than producers want to have you for the color information, um, I have two 25-inch OLED monitors, uh, so I can look at cameras independently. And then I have a master monitor where I switch the cameras through. Um, all of this is rolling around set. It's all completely self-contained uh, with a power backup unit. Um, with the uh, uh, Macintosh, I have a Mac Pro Book uh, tower on uh, set, pretty large size computer that's integrated into my cart. And um, it's like a little floating post-production platform. Features, I probably would uh, gravitate towards Colorfront. Um, Colorfront on set dailies because it allows the digital lab to have the most amount of speed when producing eight to 10 deliverables. But my personal day-to-day, -day, what I use for majority of the jobs that I do is a Simulit Scratch. Uh, either Labs, which is probably the most common, um, or uh, Final Scratch, which is the higher-end $25,000 version. Uh, Resolve, for me personally, probably represents 5% of the jobs that I do uh, because of stability or or uh, retooling of my equipment in order to make that system work whereas I really can be more efficient with scratch plus I have a, I've been using it longer um, because uh, resolve is only a couple years old whereas scratch has been around since the 2000s and that's what I started with first in order to do the work I do so when I first get a project, um, one of the big con considerations I have is whether or not I'm going to be going Firewire or eSATA um, or Thunderbolt or basically what the connection is going to be between the data and the computer and then the computer and the hard drive. Um, that depends on a lot of things. It depends on uh, the budget, what the producer has available, um, what my time constraints are, um, and what we're shooting on. Like, for instance, there is the uh, Alexa, um, the, the new Alexa camera. It only shoots to, it shoots to a hard drive that's so big, it basically requires an SAS connection in order to download that data in a timely manner. Um, when you're shooting on a project that has, like, maybe three reds, 
you don't want to be doing FireWire or FireWire 800 because your maximum amount of data rate is 800 uh, megabits per second. So if you're getting it at that slow speed, there's no way you can get through those three cards doing two backups before you get another card. Because on average, they're shooting about a card every maybe hour, hour and a half. And if you're filling the card up to maybe 70 or 80 gigs, you're looking at about 30 minutes per drop. And if you have three cards, that's almost three hours that you have. And then they're just going to keep dropping cards on you and cards on you, and you're going to get so backed up. So ideally, regardless, I usually ask for an eSATA or a Thunderbolt-based system or a USB 3.0 now as well. Um, but it doesn't always end up being that way. My DIT cart has uh, kind of grown over the years based on the projects that I was on. I actually started out with just a laptop and two PCIe cards that allowed me to download CF cards and attach eSATA cables because after the first project I did, I realized that you cannot do data management without eSATA. FireWire is far too slow. Uh, FireWire 400 is obviously even slower, and then USB 2.0 is ridiculous to do. Um, so you definitely need at least a laptop and the ability to use eSATA cards um, or eSATA connectors. So what I ended up doing is I went out and I found a company called Sonnet. And Sonnet builds these enclosures that allow you to add PCIe cards, the cards that go into a computer system, into this box that's about, about that big. So I went and I bought um, eSATA 6 gigabit per second um, cards, and I bought one that has two eSATA gigabit, uh, 6 gigabit uh, slots as well as uh, two USB 3.0s so that I could do USB, I could do eSATA, and of course I'm running off a of Mac so I can do Thunderbolt as well, which basically is the entire gamut that you would need. And then the uh, new systems with Alexa, they use the SAS card. But because I have that external enclosure, I can then just drop that card right into the enclosure and use that. So it's, it's amazing. It's like having a, a portable computer that you can attach to your laptop and it's small. So those are the things that um, I first got when, uh, when I came and started doing DIT work. Uh, some of the other important things, you definitely have to have a UPS, an, un an uninterrupted power supply. Um, the reason you need that is because you're, sometimes you're lucky and you get to plug in a house power, but a lot of times when you're on location, you're hooked up to a Jenny. And the grips and the gaffers, as they're going around and they're breaking things down or they're moving, sometimes they don't realize that you're on that system. So if they flip that Jenny off, you need that 45 minutes in order that the UPS will give you and keep your system up and running to you need that time in order to find a grip or an electric, get that started back up and get yourself plugged in. Because if you're in the middle of a transcode or a download, that could wipe an entire drive if it stops right in the middle of that. So um, that's definitely important. That's like one of the number one things that you need. And then there's other things that you can pick up. Like um, I have uh, two Marshall monitors that are calibrated for color that I can use for field monitors or that I could run right out of my system so that I can check and color correct on set. I have a cart that, you know, when you're in locations that um, you can't find a place to set up, I have a cart so I can just set everything on my cart and then wheel myself around if need be, which was great in this project in Louisiana that I was on because we were in this giant Air Force base and we were going from one room to another room and it was like on the other side of the building so it wasn't a situation where I could be there, have them run a card to me and then run back. It's like a, a 10 minute walk from one side to the other. So being mobile at that point was key to me being successful on that project. Another benefit of having your own uh, DIT van or just a van that's blacked out, that has a constant viewing environment. Even if you can't have your own van, you can load in all your camera, your DIT equipment before the camera gear gets in, you position, you find a little spot on the camera truck that you can black out with a drape, you know, you figured all that, the ergonomics of your workspace out. Is that um, with a van, you, you're able to have everything dialed in, you just rock up, You've already made friends with your gang boss and they know exactly where you need to be, which is as close as possible to the, uh, to the Jenny. And, the Jenny. and you're close enough to the set at the same time that the director or agency can walk on because that's what they do. They walk into your van. And no one has to wait for you either at the end of the day. You've got your own shore power if you need it in your van, a 6K battery bank, or you've got 
you're supplied with uh, power from the jenny or house, and um, you do your work. You don't have to set up. You've already got everything set up, so you can show if there's a bit of downtime. Whilst people are setting up the first um, first scene of day two, for instance, then that's where your DP, your director, your agency can come on, and we can show off the work that we've done the day before. It also gives everyone the ability to see their work in the highest resolution, at the highest quality, not just transcoded dailies. So there's no discussion of why does it look soft, why isn't it sharp, check your focus, etc., etc., etc. And then at the end of the day, um, you know, when the last card's been given to you, you've got about half an hour, 40 minutes, you dial in the grade if it's different. Hopefully it's not, it's just a continuation of the card, the, scene, the same scene. And you've been wise enough from experience to get the cards sooner rather than later from your, from your, um, from your crew. And you transcode it. PAs don't have to wait. Gang boss can, they all, everyone can go. Even security, everyone can go. The production always going to be probably the last ones because they're in their motorhome or whatever they're doing. You know, last minute paperwork or the next day's work. There's always work to be done. So within half an hour of getting the last card, 45 minutes, you hand over your drive, you're done. And if those shots need to be logged for editorial, then yeah, there'd be a slight delay because they just have to like rename them. But they can already be doing that. You know, they could already be doing like a cheat sheet on a text, like a text edit, you know, text edit, a little note or word pad. They can be typing in all the names already. So then you just have to do copy paste, copy paste, copy paste, copy paste, copy paste. I own 95% of what I use. That last 5% is going to be something like a Codex Vault, or I might even buy a Dual Dock or something like that, which is a card reader. But those are $10,000, $30,000, $40,000, not something I'm using every day all the time. Uh, my computers, my monitors, my waveforms. Uh, color panels, cart, raids, all that stuff I use on every job. I'll bring different equipment based on what is needed. Uh, a lot of times it's the same equipment or some pieces of equipment that we use almost every time, like a good monitor or a good waveform monitor. But uh, uh, depending on what the dailies requirements, what camera you're shooting, that uh, the computing part might change. Like tomorrow, I'm actually shooting with the, uh, we're starting a job where we're using the Alexa XT uh, recording to Airy Raw. And uh, so I'm bringing a Mac Pro with a um, XT card reader and uh, a SAS card. And, uh, and the cards that I'm configuring inside the machine are uh, optimized so that I can and the reason why I have more, I've invested such a great amount is because it changes every year. Um, what I did for an Alexa M, uh, which is a fiber optically connected Alexa to uh, the processing unit, which is a normal looking Alexa body, for me in order to run the fiber optics um, and to have the, the processor units with the codex recorders on my cart in order to change out mags and, and to look that they're rolling and verifying that we're recording and all that stuff, um, I needed to reinvest basically in infrastructure in my cart. None of that investment was actually monitors at all. It was all shock racks and power conditioners and power supplies and fold out racks. It's like, it's I have to, unfortunately, every time I do a movie, I invest $10,000 at least. Very rarely is it, you know, less than that. <laughs> it happens, though. Low-budget movie, I certainly don't invest anything, but when it's, uh, you know, 30 million above, usually I, I'm having to. Because it's just it's particular to what their needs are, and I prefer to own it. If I need it, then it makes sense. I can use it for another job, or if I don't need it after that, I sell it. Or I give it to another DIT, or... Or...
use Mac Pros, yes. Yeah. Well, and to be fair, I also use uh, MacBook Pro. I use uh, the Retina MacBook Pro. And uh, I'll network all three computers together. I use uh, two, MacBook, um, two Mac Pros and the one MacBook Pro. Uh, the MacBook Pro is networked via um, Thunderbolt to uh, Ethernet uh, adapter. And uh, that gives me connections to the other two computers. Now, sometimes I will actually use the, uh, the MacBook Pro as an ingest station. It will ingest and send the data to, uh, over the network to my, uh, my RAID 5 um, just through Ethernet, just through gigabit Ethernet. So I have used it in that capacity. I use Thunderbolt uh, on my Mac, uh, MacBook Pro. Now, I don't have need for a Thunderbolt uh, hard drives right now because, frankly, post-production, they're not uh, up to speed with Thunderbolt technology yet. I mean, nobody's, nobody's really up to speed with Thunderbolt technology unless you're using MacBook Pros, and MacBook Pros are just not beefy enough to handle the day-to-day -day work that they're doing uh, in post. Um, at the very least, they, someone may have an, uh, an iMac, but it's still, the computing power on that is far uh, below that of, uh, of the comparable Mac Pros. So, and Mac Pros don't have native uh, Thunderbolt uh, capability yet, so not much. Well, this is a cart that I'm prepping for a job uh, starting tomorrow. And it is a DaVinci Resolve system with live grade. And so I have a 23-inch um, NEC monitor for my GUI. Then I have a 17-inch Sony OLED uh, to view both the live feed and uh, the footage that's downloaded. So I'll alternate on the input to uh, uh, view which, which footage. And... Um, so we have a 12 core and uh, and a cart that can roll over almost everything. I do. I have one control surface dedicated for the color correction of the footage uh, for transcoding, and then the other control surface dedicated to live grade, so that I don't have to share the two surfaces.